Hebrews chapter 4 tells us the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I'm Pastor Bob Gray. I pastor the Emmanuel Baptist Church. Thank you for taking the time to come visit our YouTube channel. The Word of God is preeminent here at church, and we pray that every time the Bible's opened, every time the Word of God is spoken, that lives are changed. Thank you again for being here. Enjoy the services, and if I can do anything for you, my number's at the bottom of the screen. I would love to to hear from you. Now, let's get right to the preaching of God's Word. Take your Bibles, if you would, go to the book of Luke chapter 17. Uh, Luke chapter 17. If I have a little bit more on the platform, guys, that would be great. Luke chapter 17. Just a couple of mentions, if I could. It's good to have the Hill family with us, and uh, they have been uh, trying to move this way, and they finally did, and so praise the Lord for that. And then uh, Brother Hubbard and his family got everything moved in okay. And so we praise the Lord on that, and uh, that way you didn't have to get your wife out there to lift all that heavy stuff, and so, uh, but praise the Lord. And then uh, Mrs. Eric Stad is visiting with us this morning with her son, and uh, we are so honored that uh, ever so often they slip in and uh, pray for Miss Eric Stad. She has surgery Wednesday, and so church, if we can keep her in our prayers, and then we'll send out a couple of notifications there, and pray, pray, pray. Uh, for the many, many families right now that are struggling uh, with this flu. And uh, just pray the Lord uh, makes it break soon. It's been lingering in our house uh, since Monday. So uh, we had a big Thanksgiving planned, and we were having a lot of people over to the house. And then Monday, Tuesday, it just went south from there. And uh, so just pray for, for Kelly and rg luke 17 verse 20 there are two uh, um, verses here and could we stand if you're able luke chapter 17 and verse number 20 and verse number 21 and we are going to be turning to some scriptures this morning i am going to put some of them on the screen and uh, this morning for emphasis sake and that way you don't have to take the time to turn to them but luke 17 verse number 20 and verse number 21 and it's very rare that I, I take out two, two verses out of the rest of it, but I'm going to read the rest of it. But let's just read these two together out loud. Luke 17, 20 and verse 21. Ready? And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. That little phrase right there, the kingdom of God is within you. And let's take this text and let's learn a little bit throughout the Bible about this kingdom. The kingdom of God is within you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm, I'm asking this morning that, 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 Lord, we could just fight through the physical distraction. Lord, I, I know that just the people getting over this kind of illness, that they still physically are weak, and their mind is probably in a fog just a little bit, and, but God, I so appreciate the fact that they fought through uh, on the other side of being ill, that they came to your house today, and God, I ask that you would honor, Lord, your word, and as your word is preached, that you would lift it up out of itself, and Lord, just help us on this day. We thank you for what we've heard so far and the rededication of Elizabeth and the dedication of the twins. And Lord, may we all lay prostrate before you with our hearts open. God, please speak to us on this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Pick up in verse 22, and he said unto the disciples, the days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to, shall say to you, see here. Or, see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he's talking about here his millennial reign when he sets up everything. But look what he says here in verse 25. But first, must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, or Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, talking about the people that as he preached for 120 years, this, this, this get into the ark. Look what it says. They did eat, they drank, 
They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the, will the eagles be gathered together. In the context of what we just read, he's talking about the millennial reign. He's talking about the very end. That life will start progressing and people will start living with no awareness that there is a kingdom. That Jesus is coming to establish his kingdom. And when you read down through here, look at verse 20, but I find this very interesting in verse number 20. At the very beginning of this, he says that, that this, this Pharisees, this relationship, that the Pharisees demanded. And I find that interesting. Here is man demanding of the Son of God, and that they said this, when the kingdom of God should come. The Pharisees were saying, hey, I want to know, you've been talking a lot about your kingdom, when is it coming? When will your kingdom be here? They, they too, like the disciples, even in Acts chapter 1, the disciples said, Lord, are you going to set up your kingdom right now? Now, here's a sub-truth that I want to bring to us today. He said that you're not going to see this. Look what he says. You will not see my kingdom does not come with observation. What it's saying is you cannot take a pair of binoculars and you cannot look out among the landscape and you cannot see it being built. He said you cannot look down the road and see a structure being put into place. There will be no dirt work. There will be no steel. There will be no concrete. You won't ride past and say, ah, there is where his kingdom will be. They thought that he was coming to bring a kingdom that would overthrow the Gentile kingdom. Just like everybody, he talked a lot about his kingdom. So here you say, you find, they said, Lord, when is your kingdom coming? Look at verse 21. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, this is interesting, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, now this is very interesting that he said the kingdom of God within you. He was not talking about it was within the Pharisees. He was not talking about it was on the inside of them. What he was saying was, it's within you. Take this group of people that is in the society, you don't even realize who's standing in the middle of you. Would you take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2? How do we know this was, was the context of what he was saying? So please know, he was not looking at the Pharisees and saying, Look, the kingdom of God is within you as a person. What he was saying was the kingdom of God is standing right here. Now, please get what I'm about to tell you. Because when you and I understand we are living in a day to where people give no credence to the kingdom of God or to this kingdom that God has. They live and they do and they go and they buy and they sell and they make decisions without even God in mind. But look what it said in Matthew 3, 2, and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. Was John the Baptist talking about a building? Was he talking about an army? Or was he talking about Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ. It was confirmed in Matthew 4, 17. Look at Matthew 4, 17. Boy, this is going to be very, very important for the lesson. Look at Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the what, please? Kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Let me tell you what John the Baptist was saying when he said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh the way of the world. You know what he was saying? Hey, the kingdom showed up. Jesus said, let me tell you something, the kingdom's at hand. The kingdom is right there. You can touch the kingdom of God. I find it very interesting that when people try to split hairs over the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Let's see what Jesus had to say about it. Because people try to be experts with the Bible where Jesus just cuts it with two verses. Go to Matthew 19. Are you there? Matthew chapter 19. I love how the Lord just puts to rest arguments. I've been asked many times, what is the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God? And I searched every time the kingdom of heaven was used and the kingdom of God is used. And maybe I'm just too simplistic, but I'll stick to what the Lord said. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 23 talking about the rich man. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again I say unto you, it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So in the same context, guess what Jesus said? They're the same. Whether you're talking about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, and this is what he was trying to tell them. The kingdom is not a structure the kingdom is a person you see a lot of times we look for performance rather than a person the kingdom is not a building the kingdom is not an army the kingdom is not ground the kingdom is not a palace it's not an embassy it's not an assembly building you know what the kingdom is jesus christ because when jesus comes to reign and to rule Jesus is the one that makes everything on that geography his kingdom. And what they were trying to do is back him into a corner. So you've been talking a lot about your kingdom, Jesus. When we demand, I love it, I love it, the religious right. We demand of you, when is your kingdom coming? And Jesus said, well, you won't see my kingdom with observation. You won't be able to point at an address and say, there it is, because Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. He said, you're not going to see it with observation. Jordan and I had a chance this past week before Thanksgiving to go on an elk hunt. We didn't get anything. I'm not a hunter, so we climbed to 8,200 feet on top of this mountain, whatever you want to call this thing. We drove 6,200, 6,500. It's one degree. We get out, it's six degree, a heat wave has happened. And you are marching like this, going straight up. God bless Brother Loman. God bless that man. He's in front of us. We're huffing. We have to stop. We huff. We have to stop. We huff. We have to stop. I've never used a pair of binoculars in my life. When I was studying for this a couple of weeks ago, observation. When you, you're not a hunter, you've never used binoculars, observation, but after you've been hunting and you have to use binoculars, observation means a whole nother thing. Well, I'm standing on top and we're hunting a bull elk. I guess that's what it's called. I guess that's what I had tagged for. And, uh, and so, so I have my binoculars and I'm, I, I'm so dumb, I had to ask how to use binoculars. I said, Brother Loman, what does this thing mean over here? He said, well, you adjust it to your dominant eye and then you bring it together and it's like... It was amazing. You could see after that. And so we're standing up there, and he says, I want you to look down in that clearing down there. Do you see that elk? So I've got my binoculars, and I'm looking down there, and I'm like, yeah, I see the elk. He's laying down. He's bedded down. And he said, now look, I'm going to take Jordan with me. It's going to take us two hours to get off this mountain. It's going to take us two hours, but we're going to come out in that clearing right down there. He said, you stay in here and keep an eye on that elk. Y'all, listen, I don't hunt. I don't know why I'm on top of this mountain. I don't know why I'm supposed to keep my observation on that elk. So they come down into that clearing. And so sure enough, I see them. They come out in the clearing. And they wave at me. So I wave back at them. They wave at me again. And so I wave back at them. I'm standing up there. And I'm just doing this number. And, and they're waving at me. I'm waving at them. And I'm thinking, this is the dumbest way to hunt I've ever seen in my life. So I just go sit down. I'm like, I'm done waving. So I'm cold. It's six degrees, seven degrees on top of this stupid mountain. So I just go sit down. They come back up that mountain. And God bless Brother Loman. He was like, you have never done this before, have you? 
And I was like, no. He said, your job was to tell us which way the elk went when we got down there. Well, I thought you just went down there to wave at me. I didn't know what my job was to tell you. And I'm like, well, that elk went that way. And uh, so, y'all, observation. You know, you know what he's saying? You won't see it. If you're looking for my kingdom, you're not going to see it developing in front of you like I saw them. They're standing there. The elk's right over there. If I had known that, I'd just say, go that way and shoot, and you'll get it. <laughs> but, but I didn't know. You know, what the, you know what the Pharisees were saying? Tell us, tell us, when's your kingdom coming? And then you start marching down, and we must remember this, and here's the truth this morning. The sub-truth is simply this. You won't see God's kingdom with observation because the kingdom is within you. Do you have any idea what he just said to the Pharisees? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is standing in the middle of you. And how many times do we overlook Jesus to look for something that is developing rather than Jesus who is right here with us? And and if you would, go to Daniel chapter 7. If you would, go to Daniel chapter 7 because now we need to talk about that his kingdom. So now we're going to talk about his kingdom and and I want you to look at Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. And know this, That Jesus is Lord of all. Now that's not a trite statement this morning. He's Lord. Whether you make him Lord or not, ladies and gentlemen, he's Lord. And let me show you what his kingdom. There is coming a day when he is going to set up his kingdom. Look at Daniel chapter 7 and verse number 13. I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before me, and there was given him, what please? Dominion. There was given him what? Dominion and glory in a kingdom that all people... Very interesting here that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. This is the vision Daniel had. Now go to Revelation chapter 11 and verse number 15. Revelation chapter 11 and verse number 15. You, you, You and I must understand if you're looking for a visible takeover, In the world around you, that's not his kingdom. But look at Revelation 11, 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was a great voice, great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and what? Ever. Listen, there is coming a day when Jesus will mount the throne on this earth and he will reign of his kingdom. But the kingdom is him. The kingdom is not anything else but him. And the Pharisees said, tell us where your kingdom's at. He said, it's not there and it's not there. The kingdom is right within you it's standing right in the middle and Daniel said he's going to have dominion revelation tells us at that point in the future he will have dominion but you and I live in a very blessed situation how many can say right now you are saved would you raise your hand how many you can point back you're saved God bless you you're saved So God did something very amazing. If you are not living a spiritually fulfilled life on the inside, it is because you have not yielded the throne of your heart, mind, and soul to the king that will have complete rule. Did you hear that? There should be within you the kingdom of God and there's only two people one of two people that sit on the throne of your life it is either you 
And either you sit here and you occupy your mind, your heart, and your soul, because what is the first commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all. Every emotional makeup, every willful part of you, you are either your own kingdom or you recognize the kingdom that is to come, the God that one day will rule that kingdom has put his Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And when he said the kingdom is within you, he meant at that time in Luke that the kingdom is standing right here in you. But for you and I, you know what that means? The kingdom is within you. Have you grasped that yet? Have I, do I fully understand that yet? So if Bob Gray is living a spiritually unfulfilled life, it is not because he does not reign. It is because I have not yet recognized the kingdom of God lives within me. Now I want you to notice, go to Isaiah, don't turn down, we'll put these up on the screen. Isaiah 54, 13, if you guys will put that up there on the screen. Well, I want you to notice what it says, and all thy children, this is what the kingdom's going to be like. When he's reigning and ruling on the earth, and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, great shall be the, say it please, great shall be the what? Peace. Peace. This is his kingdom when he has taken possession in Revelation. Can I ask you a question? Is this the kingdom that's within you? Are you living in anxiousness? Or are you living in peace? If this is his kingdom then this is the kingdom within you. Verse 14. Verse 14. I'm sorry. Ezekiel 34, 25. That didn't mess up. I did. Ezekiel 34, 25. Throughout the Old Testament, you're going to find, it talks about his kingdom. And I will make with them a covenant of what, please? And will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell. What what is that? Safely. In the wilderness and what please sleep in the I got tired of playing air traffic controller on top of the mountain and I'm all bundled up like this with an orange vest and I I can't see anything it is now 10 degrees outside I'm freezing the Sun's peeking up so I lay down on top of this mountain and I just go to sleep I just put my gun and I just go to sleep. Y'all, I'm in the middle of a wilderness and I have never had such great sleep. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. I demand to see your kingdom. The kingdom is within you. And I'm going to ask you, are you restful on the inside? Are you at peace on the inside? Or is there anxiety? His kingdom will be marked by safety in the woods, sleep in the woods, safety in the wilderness. Peace is a covenant of peace. If you would, go to Isaiah chapter 11 in the booth. Isaiah chapter 11. And look at his kingdom. This is what's going to happen. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leper shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion shall, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. This is when when God is ruling, look at it, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play in the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. This is the kingdom. Jesus said this, show us your kingdom. Show us your army. Show us your militant. Show us how you're going to reign and rule. He said, you're not going to see it anywhere out there because the kingdom's standing right here within you. And one day he's going to split that eastern sky. One day he's coming back to put his feet on the Mount of Olivet. He's going to rent it and he's going to reign 
and he's going to rule, and it'll be nothing but a covenant of peace. It'll be nothing but safety. You'll sleep anywhere. Nothing's going to happen to you. The children shall lead wild, wild, wild animals. The children can walk up to the hole of a, of a snake of dens and put their hand down in there, and nothing. This is peace. And I come to you today to tell you this. The kingdom of God is within you. And if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit of God living on the inside of you. And guess what should be ruling on the inside of us? The kingdom of God. Would you go to Galatians, if you will, Galatians chapter 5, and please don't just discount the familiarity of the text, but look at Galatians chapter 5. Boy, I'm, if you right now, spiritually on the inside, you're like, I just, I just don't know what's wrong with me. I do, because the kingdom of God's not reigning and ruling, because if it is, then there's peace, there's tranquility. You should be able to walk around a world that is so out of control, but the kingdom is right here on the inside because the kingdom is not a structure. The kingdom is a person. And you've got the Holy Ghost. Look what it says here. But the fruit of the Spirit is what, please? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. When the Holy Spirit is reigning, listen to this, I am not love. I am not joy. I'm not peace. I'm not long-suffering. I'm not gentle. I'm not good. I don't have faith. I'm not meek, and I don't temper anything. And when I'm ruling, it's not his kingdom. And this is why man gets out of control. This is why we have such mass murders in our society. This is why people go into a mall and shoot people. Because the kingdom is not reigning and ruling in their hearts and in their life. But I'll tell you something worse than that. It's believers who walk into a church and they are in turmoil on the inside. And they can't live this kingdom-oriented life. But if you'll get off the throne of your life, if you'll stop reigning and ruling in your life and say, Holy Ghost, one day we're headed to a kingdom. I want that kingdom to start right what's the next word i'm going to say now one last set of verses and i asked them to put it up on the screen romans 15 verse 10 and again he saith rejoice ye gentiles with his people and again praise the lord all ye gentiles and laud him all ye people and again isaiah or isaiah saith there shall be a root of Jesse. And stop on this verse before we go to the next one. And there shall be a root of Jesse, he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the, what? Gentiles trust. Don't go any further. When I was explaining the truth of this to somebody several months ago, they looked at me and said, everything you've just quoted to me is a promise to the Jews and to the nation of Israel. And I said, may I remind you, when we got saved, we were grafted in. We are not by nature the children of Abraham, but we are because the root of Jesse died on an old rugged cross and forgave us, and now Gentiles can what? Trust in him. If you're sitting here thinking you're handicapped because you're not a Jew, that's not true because Jesus took care of it all. But look at verse 13 and beyond. Now the God of hope fill you with all what? Joy and peace in believing that ye, this is to the Gentiles, that ye may what please? 
abound in hope through the what? Power of the Holy Ghost. The day that you trusted Jesus as your Savior was the day that the Holy Ghost made available to you a kingdom that's to come. And if you're not that way on the inside, it's not his fault. Have, have you ever wanted to go to church just be happy? Let me say, happy? But I got something more than that. Don't you want a life that's happy? Depression is real. Mental illness is real. But I'll tell you what also is real. A believer who lives a defeated life and a sad life. Because that believer every day jumps up onto the throne of his life. But guess what your kingdom is not? Your kingdom's not filled with love and joy and peace and gentleness and goodness and long-suffering. That's not us. How many would agree you're nasty at times? Okay. How many would agree you're not too pleasant to be around at times? I love it. I love it. Victoria's pointing at Kirby, saying, Kirby, raise your hand. <laughs> How many would agree that you don't like you after you've been nasty? Then how about we change that? How about we recognize that when the Pharisee said, I demand of you to see the kingdom, Jesus said, you won't see it with observation because the kingdom is within you. He's right there. He's right there. And I believe this, that if every one of us would let Jesus, through the Holy Ghost, sit on the throne of our life, that we can live in peace. Marriages should not be fighting. There should be no fighting in the Christian home. There, there should be no, no fighting among brethren. And the only time there's fighting is because somebody's not letting that kingdom grow on the inside. You say, well, I'm, I've been done wrong, like Jesus. Well, I didn't deserve it, like Jesus. But why did he come? You know why he came? To give us a kingdom. I love it. And I know we're fighting through a lot of flu and a lot of different health issues and, and I'm going to shut it down 20 minutes earlier than I normally do. I'm going to ask you today, what is the inside of you like? I see the outside. I see it. Looks good, smells good. Smile. What's this on the inside? And if you're like, you know, pastor, it's not the kingdom that we're going to live in. It's not a kingdom of peace. It's not a kingdom of joy. If my children touch me on the inside, I, I flare up at them. I'm like a venomous snake. I bite at them. The wolf and the lamb are not lying down together on the inside of me. If there's no peace on the inside, listen, then the wrong person's sitting on the throne. But if you're here this morning... You've never had this. You, you've tried everything. You've tried making a new you, and maybe, maybe a new me will do it. Some of you can't wait to January to come so you can try a new resolution to make sure that you can take away what's going on on the inside. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the only thing you need is to get saved. Because once you get saved, there's available to you a world. Brother Woods, I'm thinking about the morning that you walked down and got saved. And I didn't know why God had me change the sermon for that morning about being born again. But you said something that morning that has stuck with me. And it was something to the degree that what everybody else has, I don't have. That was huge. Because I'm telling you, there are days when the Holy Spirit reigns and, man, this is a wonderful world to live in. But there are days I crawl up on there, and it's a terrible day to live in. There are seasons to where I'm on the throne, and this is not a good six months. 
This is not a good three weeks. And would you all straighten up your halos because I'm feeling all alone up here. But then there are seasons of my life to where you crawl up on there. I want peace. There's the in and out of that. But to never have that. To never have that. Can I ask you a question? Do you look around at other Christians and say, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have that. It's not a that. It's a him. Because a kingdom is not what you see. It's not seen by observation. The kingdom is a person. That's Jesus Christ. Thank you for spending your time with us. Whether you watch the entire sermon or you just scrubbed yourself through to different points, I do appreciate you taking the time. If I can do something for you, please let me know. And I would encourage you, keep living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep putting him first and tell others about him. And I promise you, you'll find that fulfillment that you're looking for. God bless you. Thank you for watching us.